Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vineyardchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. Now here's this week's message. Oh, cool. Five bucks. Wait! What the? That's so weird. I thought I heard something. You did. You know what you should do. You should go and treat yourself to a frappuccino. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. What you really need to do is save for college, your kids, college for okay, your kids. Okay, okay. Wait. Actually, you really need to be donating to charity, sending us. Good to see you guys this morning. <clears throat> now we are in our fifth and final talk about in our series called Money Talks. And so far we have looked at money talking to us and saying, serve me, spend me, save me, and free me, right? And so we have talked over these weeks about how not to love money, how to address our uncontrolled spending, you know, and having that budget. We talked about how wise it is to save for uh, the, you know, for the future and not to cross over that line of hoarding but to, so we can address the social concerns around us but that we are to save. And then we talked about being able to get free of, of debt because debt is like bondage. And today I want to talk to you about the conversation, this last installment in this series where money talks to us and it says, give me, give me. And so I want to explain what that means. But before I jump into that, will you bow your heads with me? And I'm just going to ask the Holy Spirit to come more. Okay? Father God, I thank you so. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you just come and that you'd fill up this room, Lord God, that you would fill, <clears throat> yes, that you would fill me, Lord, with uh, your power and might, Father, to deliver your word just as you have placed it in my heart, that you would overcome even my weaknesses. I thank you, Father, that you love the congregation that's in here, that you love the people that you brought them here. And so I ask that you would speak to their hearts. And so, yes, I bind the spirit uh, that would cause them to be distracted or cause them to not be able to sit and be at peace. Father says he wants you at peace this morning. So, Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would come and that you would do only what you can do, Father. So may you be glorified in all that we do the next uh, 30 minutes. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> all right, guys. The Bible teaches us that everything belongs to God, right? That you and I, we're just managers, that we are not the owners. <clears throat> and so God wants us to be able to spend money that he gives us, right? He wants to be able to, for us to be able to spend it, to save it, and to give it according to what he says, that we're just to be managers of that. And that's why I spent the last five weeks or so talking about money, looking at everything that God wants us to do with his money, John Wesley, a father of the Methodist movement, he said this about money. Earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. Now, what I want you to notice in that statement, he doesn't say spend all you can, <laughs> right? Because he knows we have that natural propensity to do that, to spend what we earn, and a lot of us beyond that. And so we have a hard time saving and being able to give it away. And because of that, I've made this message to end with give me, because that's the, the last thing that I think that God wants us to unwrap here. And I know a lot of people, <clears throat> they would like to give, but they can't give because they're up to their eyeballs in debt, right? That they're spending so much, uh, even beyond what they're making, that there's nothing left to give. And that's why we have to control our spending. That's why I spent all those weeks talking to you about that, okay? Now, to me, there's nothing more joyful than being able to give, right? To be able to give to God and to give to people in need, that brings the biggest amount of joy I know in my life. And when I look at why, it's because I'm a child of the God most high, right? I love my Father in heaven, and at the base and the core of who he is, he is a giver. He's a giver, and he has given us so much. He has given 
to me, the most precious gift I could ever have, right? You see, he saw me when I was lost. He saw me when I was really making some bad choices and going down a, a road and a path of destruction. And so he loved me so much that he put somebody in my pathway that told me that there was a way to find forgiveness and freedom and a way back to him through his son, Jesus Christ. And then Jesus, when I met him, Jesus is the son of God. I learned that Jesus is also like his father. He's a giver because he gave his life for my sins, that they might be paid in full, that I might have this gift of forgiveness and this access back to the Father, right? And so the greatest gift that I have ever been given in my life is the gift of salvation. And it's not just for me, it's also for you, okay? That story I just told you is for you. And I start out there because I know <laughs> that there are people today in this audience that you've come here um, yeah, somebody's invited you to this church or maybe you saw it on the website. Maybe it's the holiday time and somebody in your family said, hey, come to church and you're being a good egg. And you said, sure, I'll come, right? And so you find yourself sitting here, but I want you to know that the Lord appointed you to come here today because he wanted you to hear that you matter greatly to him, that he loves you and that he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And it's for good, it's to bring you a hope and a future. And so this message of love and redemption of this gift of salvation that you're hearing about, it's not enough just to hear. You must accept it for oneself. You've got to accept for yourself. And in that, he creates this personal relationship between Father God and yourself. Now, those of you that don't have this relationship, uh, the Lord has instructed me to talk to you first this morning that at the end of my time uh, presenting what God has put on my heart, I'm going to give you an opportunity to line up your life with his and to answer the call that he has to you this morning. That's why you're here. That's why God has brought you here. And I pray that you take that opportunity. Now, as I said earlier, I'm a daughter of the God Most High. That means I love the Lord with all my heart. And because of that, I want to be like him. I want to be a giver. And I know that's true of a lot of you. And so there are lots of ways that we can give. Today, I want to look at three kinds of giving that Christians have been doing for over 20 centuries. And so we're going to take a look at that. If you pull out your outline, I'm going to jump right into the teaching. On your outline, the first type of giving that we have is to be able to give the tithe to God, to give the tithe to God. You see, in the Old Testament, the Israelites gave the tithe to God, and the tithe is the first tenth of their income. So farmers, they gave the first tenth of their crop, right? And so shepherds, they gave the first tenth of their herds. And then for merchants, they gave the first tenth of their profit. Now, tithing means tenth. It means the number tenth, like a tenth percent, right? And the Israelites understood this, and they understood that everything belonged to the Lord, everything, and that he had uh, asked them to give him the tenth, and this was their way of acknowledging and thanking him for having their life and all the generosity that they're showing, to, you know, God showed to them. So the tithe that, that was taken during that time was brought to the temple uh, there, and it was used to help the temple function and also to pay for the priests and the Levites to live, and then also a portion of it was used to help those in need, to help the poor. Now, everyone was expected to participate in the tithe, all of God's people, but not everybody did. And this is what God says about it in Malachi 3, 8 through 10. He says this, Will you rob God? Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do I rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe, which is that 10%, into the storehouse, that there will be food in my house. Test me, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. So God used some really, uh, I think, some very um, tough words here when he says, hey, people, if you're not tithing, it's robbing me. That's pretty strong. Well, then I see again in Leviticus 27, 30, where the theme is continued. It says, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the tree, belongs to the Lord. Look at this. It is holy. Circle that word holy to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. 
So again, the scripture is pointing to the tenth that is given is not yours, but it actually belongs to the Lord, and that it is holy. So what does it mean to be holy? Holy means to be set apart. It is to be set apart. So if you spend it, you decide to send it in a different direction, God says that's robbing him. Now, I'm a practitioner. That means I'm very practical about what I read and how it impacts me. And so when I looked at this, I thought, hmm, this is kind of like, like each month when I pay my mortgage, right? My mortgage is due. You see, when I bought my house, I borrowed the money from the bank, and I agreed to pay them back. So when I receive my income every month, all of it does not belong to me. Part of it belongs to the bank. It is holy to the bank. It is set aside for that bank. If I decide to use it in a different direction, then I am robbing the bank, right? It's kind of like I pay a utilities bill each month. When I moved into my house, I hooked up to the uh, utilities there with Dominion, and I promised to pay them for the electricity, right, that I was going to use. And so when my money comes in, not all of it is mine. There's a portion, right, that belongs to Dominion. It is holy and set aside, right, for Dominion. It's their money. And so if I spend it, I am robbing Dominion. Well, it's the same with our scripture. When the scripture tells us that the tenth belongs to the Lord, the first part of our earnings go to him, it's holy. That tenth is holy and to be set aside. And if, when we don't do that, that's robbing God. Now, those are his words. That's how it reads when you read those scriptures. Now, I had a crazy thought. I had this thought. I said, this thought. I thought, you know, I don't know anybody that would rob a bank and then go to the bank and ask them to give them money, right? I don't know anybody that wouldn't pay their mortgage, you know, for six, seven months, walk in and say, hey, can you bless me? Like, can you let me borrow more money, right? Crazy thought, because we know that doesn't happen Yet that's what people do to God. You know, they, they rob him in the tithes and the offerings, and then they say, oh, God, please bless me and bless my life, right? Oof. Well, God promises in his word that he does bless us when we obey him. Those of us that love him, we are called to obey his word, to follow it. That's how we show him that we love him also. So when we give of our tithes, we can see the blessing that follows here in the Malachi 3, 10 through 12. I'm continuing on in that passage, right? It says this, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit. First, says the Lord Almighty, then, look at this, all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord. So God says, you won't have to ask me for blessings. When you're following my word and you're doing what I say, those blessings naturally come, come about. Now, I know some of you that know the word, you're going, wait a minute, Sharon, I get it. The Old Testament says uh, that they taught tithing and the Israelites practiced it, but what about the New Testament, right? Are we not, we're not really under the old law of the Old Testament, but rather we're under grace in the, in the New Testament. Well, let me say this. The New Testament, Jesus himself said that he came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it, right? And then Jesus did make a remark about tithing here. I pulled it out because I wanted to talk to you about it. Jesus uh, thought he didn't teach directly to it. What he did is he said he assumed we were doing it, that that was an easy one we should be able to follow, right? So he does, says this in Luke eleven forty two, 42, and he's talking to the Pharisees. Woe to you Pharisees because you give God a tenth of your mint and brew and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. And so what Jesus is saying here to them is that he's correcting the Pharisees because they're into legalism. And whenever you get into legalism, what happens is you just kind of mess things up. You get it all out of whack. And so the Pharisees, they were so fastidious about even tithing to this nth of a tenth, you know, that it had to come from their herb garden, right? But yet they weren't paying any attention 
to the justice and to the love of God, right? And so God comes in, or Jesus comes in, and he's, uh, he's kind of trying to realign them, right? He's saying, hey, you're majoring on the minors, and you're minoring on the majors, and you got this thing all mixed up. And so he makes this statement here, you should have practiced the latter, which is social justice, without leaving the former undone, which is the tithing. So what he's saying is that he's endorsing tithing. Yes, that happens, but you never forget that you are also required to show social justice. In other words, you and I, we are supposed to tithe, we're supposed to give to the Lord the 10%, but then our minds and our hearts should also be moved for those that, that need us to show compassion, those that need help, the poor and the disadvantaged, that we need to remember them. And then in this Malachi scripture that I've been reading, it says bring the tithe to the storehouse. So what is the storehouse here? Well, it's a place in the temple. It's where you go to worship. It's where you go to be part. So for Andy and I, this is our community of faith that we belong to. This is our family. So we bring our tithe here. This is very important because people get this mixed up all the time, right? They think that tithing is when they give to King's Daughters or when they give to Caleb, and those are great. And I want to talk about those in the next point, but they are not considered tithing. Tithing is where you are spiritually fed, right? It's your home church. And listen, again, my practitioner mind goes to, if I'm going to shop at Food Lion, then I don't write them a check for Kroger, right? When I'm there getting my food. So you bring your tithe into the house that is feeding you. So, okay, okay, Sharon, what if I haven't been tithing? What do I do? Well, for the past four or five weeks, I have been talking to you about a plan called 101080, right? Where 10% is your tithing, it goes to the Lord, and 10% goes to your savings. And if you're really in debt, I suggested that you go after your debt and reducing that, and that you live off the 80. So I'm going to continue to suggest that you do that that you bring that whole tenth into the house of the Lord, okay? That you obey what the scripture says. That's my very best advice. Now, I have been a pastor for uh, 27, 28 years, right? And so I know I, so as much as I say that, there's some of you that are so struggling because you're like, I just can't. I just cannot do that. I can't jump there. So what do I do? And so I prayed and I felt like the Lord said this was okay to say to you that you are to have a goal of going towards the full tithe, that that is a goal that you sent out, but you start right now where you're at. If you can only give 1%, you do that. If 3%, you do that. If 5%, you do that. But your goal is to hit that 10%. So anytime God gives you a, a raise, allows you to have a raise at work, well, then you raise up your amount that you give to the Lord. Or if you're redoing your budget, see if you can't get more money out to do that tithe because you want to bring the full tithe into the house of the Lord because that's where the blessings occur. And you see, I think the Lord looks at our heart and he knows the effort we put into it and he blesses us and works with us. So talking about giving, we talk about giving to the Lord through our tithes. The second way on your outline is we give a free will offering, a free will offering. Now, what I want you to notice here. Again, in Malachi 3, it said that we are to bring the tithes and offerings in. So what's the difference, right? Well, tithe, like we've been talking, is the first tenth, and that belongs to God. Offering is given above and beyond that. That's what that is. A tithe was not a suggestion. It was expected by God, but an offering was a suggestion if you wanted to participate. And again, to use a word from the Old Testament, this is called free will giving, Okay, free will giving. It's just like it describes. It's free. You want to do it in your own volition. It's something that you want to do because you want to thank God or you want to uh, bless him or worship him. And we see this again in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 16.10. It says this, Then celebrate the festival of weeks to the Lord your God by giving a free will offering in proportion to the blessing the Lord your God has given you. What this is saying is they were having a festival, kind of like we have a fall festival. <laughs> They're having a festival here. And part of that, it's, it's, uh, the scriptures are encouraging them, if you want to give a free will gift to what God has done in your life, by all means, bring it in and bless during that time. We also see scriptures, uh, a lot of scriptures, 
that talk about the free will offering in conjunction with things like building projects. For example, the tabernacle or the temple, right? You see that in Ezra 2, 6 and 8. It says this, when the Israelites, right, arrived at the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, some of the heads of the family gave a free will offering towards the rebuilding of the house of the Lord right on site. So they came in, these Israelites, they saw the condition of the temple, and they said, well, this is not acceptable. And so they give a free will offering to give to that. Now, there are many of you that you're sitting in here, and you gave of a free will offering to buy this building that we sit in today, right? And you gave a free will offering to renovate this building that we're in. Pastor Andy and I, we also participated in that, right? For us, we gave what we thought was a, a sacrificial gift that was above and beyond what we were, uh, we were able to because we wanted to participate with everybody else. Matter of fact, the pledge that we made, I already paid that off, but I'm still giving towards that because the debt is still here that we incurred in going ahead and uh, renovating this building so it can be used, right? So what I wanted to do is I wanted to invite you to come along, and if you want to give a free will offering to that, uh, to, so that you could see that. So today what I've done is I've had my staff prepare for you uh, this sheet right here, and you can pull it out. You're given when you walked in, right? And what I want you to know is at the very top, it says that our building uh, renovation is to be paid off January the 5th, 2017. That's in five weeks, and we still owe a balance of just shy of 160000 right? It's 159000 And so what we did is we prayed about it as a staff, and we came up with uh, this grid here that if you were to give a one-time gift, if you could find yourself on this grid somewhere, right? If we get these kinds of gifts and these amounts, then in the end, we'll have paid off our, uh, our loan that we owe, the balance of that, right? Now, here's how it works. Again, Andy and I, even though we are participating, we went back and we are now looking at our finances. We're trying to figure out how we can give a year-end gift to the church and fit on this plan that would bless it. And then even when I presented it to my pastoral staff and my support staff this week, they looked at it, they went and prayed, and I had two of my pastors tell me before I came up yesterday that they found themselves on that chart and uh, that they want to participate. And then I got one of the biggest blessings, my student ministry pastor, as we were talking about it, he said, you know, I really want the uh, college age group that I'm working with to participate because they've received so much from this church, but you know, don't have very much. He goes, so I was thinking, what about if they all pulled together and they found themselves on the chart and we shopped for that, would that work? And I said, oh, that's a great plan. That's a great plan. And just when I thought I couldn't be blessed anymore, my youth pastor looked over and he goes, I think us kids can meet one of those, Sharon. You know, as a senior leader, I was just blown away by their willingness to come at this with their whole heart. You know, this past week, um, our building here, the youth, uh, we open our doors to the youth. I want, to, I want you to hear this. And so, you know, uh, Pastor Jacob prayed about it last week. So I want to give you a report what happened. They prepared a special program for the youth in our, our area. And uh, they had a special message of love. And they had a thousand kids show up here last, on Friday night. Okay, take a look. Right. Now, here's the most impressive thing. 50 of those kids gave their life to Jesus Christ. That is, that's worth anything and everything. You see, this building is used, and it's used to the glory of God. Our ministry is about finding the lost, about finding people that are far from God and bringing them close. Is that not our mission? You know, to be that contemporary extension of the good news to our community and to help those people out there find and fulfill God's calling in their life? It is. And that's what happens here. So, again, I gave you that chart. You can take a look at it. For some of you, you go, oh, yeah, I can see myself in that chart. No problem, right? God has blessed you financially. And so I would uh, encourage you to make one of those top gifts and, and do a tax write-off or whatever, but to come and to help assist the church. And then for the majority of you, you look and go, whoa, that's a lot of money. <laughs> you know, when you're looking at those, uh, those, those numbers. And so here you go. I want to encourage you to find yourself there and, and be like the young adults. Let's use them as example. 
uh, if you find that, I want to go here, but I don't have quite enough money, then if you're in a small group, get together. You guys pull it and see as a small group where you'll champion a particular part of that, okay? And if, you, if you're not in a small group and you go, gosh, I still can't do hey, just come along and participate. Give a dollar. Just say, hey, I'm in and I'm praying. You see that, right? Well, anyway, those are examples uh, of a goodwill offering towards a building, right? Towards the temple. Well, the second thing I want to talk to you about the free will offering also is to be able to give to the poor because I think that's part of what our mandate or our call is to do. So I want to spend a few minutes there to emphasize the importance of it, but also to show you some of the things that the vineyard is doing. First, when you give your tithes and offering, one of the purposes of that, when you're giving those, one of the purposes for us as pastors is to give those to the poor, right? And so we do that. I looked over my records and stuff and projected out to the completion of this year, and I saw that we will be giving between 15 and 17 percent of our total tithes will be going either directly to the poor or they go to the ministries that serve the poor, okay? And so I've asked Pastor Debbie and her staff to put together ways that you could help those that are economically challenged in our community and also outside our community, uh, you know. And so she put together this bookmark that we gave you. We just inundated you this morning with material. <laughs> but here you go, right? It's this little bookmark. If you pull it out, I want to look at it just ever so quickly. On the one side, you have uh, local outreaches and there's a whole list with the contact people and their names and you can find out more about those but i want to highlight a couple that we're actually presently in like the turkey outreach project we will prepare and distribute 200 baskets or for 200 families we will give them baskets for uh, for this thanksgiving you know with the turkey and all the fixings right and so they'll be coming into our auditorium they'll be actually setting up today and if you're in here and you want to help, it is not too late. You can stay and help, or you can go and see if they have any more food that they need. You can get it and bring it, right? You can ask at the info desk. Or come tomorrow. Come on Monday when we open up our doors for the community to come in that evening and receiving their baskets, that you just come in and love on them. Because we're not just giving them the baskets. We're also talking to them about the love of God, that God has not forgotten them and neither have we, Okay? It'll be a great outreach, and I invite you to do that. The other one I wanted to highlight is this Angel Tree Project. I love the Angel Tree Project because I love Christmas, because I love giving, right? So anyway, you'll see the tree go up next week, and on there we have the names of families that are asking for help. And uh, last year, we collected and helped 50 families to have, uh, uh, to have gifts and stuff like that, and also food baskets for Christmas. And one of the stories I wanted to bring you that I love that happened last year was this. Uh, a lady from the community, she came into the church, you know, to fill out her paper and to ask us to help her. She was a mom, a single mom. She had three kids. She lived in a two-bedroom house, and she took care of her autistic brother, okay? So she came in, and she was filling out the paperwork on what the kids, you know, the kids' ages and stuff like that and what she would like. But then she had the most interesting request it was this the request was that her brother who was autistic had been sleeping on the floor for this past year right and she said do you think you could help me to find a mattress for him so he don't have to sleep on the floor anymore well i'm going to tell you it just rocked us that we're in there and when we heard that and so there was another lady that was in there that actually had almost a brand new mattress and I'm going to tell you, that group of people, they got together, they got a truck, they got the uh, mattress, they didn't have to wait for Christmas, they brought it over the very next day, right? And so what I love about that story is that they mattered enough to people in their, you know, to have people move on their behalf, to help them in the plight that they were in. Now, there are many things you can see, the pen ministry, the food pantry, and true bread, all these ministries are outreach ministries. They help people who are economically suppressed that need food and clothing. And there's tons of ways to get involved, and I would encourage you to. And again, one of the stories that came out that I 
that I so loved uh, that happened in the True Bread ministry is they, they're actually a ministry that goes into the community, into a low-income neighborhood. And so they went in there with their truck and all their goods, and, and they, they were working with that community. Well, they met a Hispanic lady, and she had three young adult sons with her. And uh, they, you know, they would come and they would receive the things that we would bring. And they started to develop a friendship and they got invited to the church and they actually came to the church for, for a little bit. And uh, not only did they come, they took the 101. They signed up to be members. And so not only are they members now of our church, but they also are serving. They're also serving. And so to me, when I look at that, I see, God, you put them in our family. And now they're part of us and they have our DNA and they have compassion that the little they have, they want to give to other people. And so they found their place to serve. To me, that's what free will offering does. It helps to take a family and give them back their dignity and give them back a purpose for a living. Guys, this stuff is, is just so wonderful. This is why I do what I do when I look at these things. It's marvelous. And then also, not just community outreaches, but we have global outreaches. We have this uh, Mexico missions trip. Uh, it's, it's just a Mexican partnership is really what it is. We've been working with Mexico, Mazalan, for the past 16 years. We came up with a way to get you down there as, as inexpensively as we possibly could, right? And then for, for 16 years, we've worked with this community of people down there trying to help them. And they have townships all over because it's a metropolis. And so we would go in. We do all kinds of things with our medical to help the indigent. We work with children to help feed them and, and clothe them. We also, uh, you know, work with presenting the gospel. But most importantly, we undergird the missionaries that are there 360 days of the year serving these people. We come in there and we give them a shot in the arm and tell them, thank you. What, you, what you're doing matters to God, and we know it, and we're down here to sponsor you and support you in that effort. Do you see that? You know, we have been down there so long that we have built a community center also, which is like a church on a little island called Stone Island. That's where they used to send all, all those that had leprosy and that were too sick, right? Well, they would send them there, and, and God moved upon our hearts that that would be our home base. So whenever we go, we make sure we spend a couple of days there with them, and we have completely fallen in love with that community and working with them, and we've seen them grow tremendously over the years. And one of the things that came out of this is the child sponsorship program that we have here. For $15 a month, you can sponsor one of these kids. Um, you'll be able to see that because the books and all will come out for Christmas to show you. But let me tell you, there was a photograph that you saw up there just a few moments ago, and that was with one of the people that went on the missions trip. She, her family had sponsored a child, and when she was there, she was able to, to find that child in one of the colonials went to, and she was able to, to give her a hug and to love on her. And I tell you, it was the coolest thing to watch and to be a part of. You make a difference in their lives, and I want you to know that. Then our newest partnership I want to make sure that you're aware of is we're going to work with Convoy of Hope. Some of you might know what they are. They are the first responders when national, uh, national disasters happen, na natural, natural, whatever, disasters happen. Like I was thinking of the, you know, the, um, the uh, Caribbean and the United States, we just got hit with that hurricane and Matthew, yeah, right? Well, they were first to respond. They were there to help. They even came to Virginia to help some of the communities here that were hard hit, right? So we want a partnership up. You'll hear more about our partnership in 2017 with them, okay? Well, there are all kinds of wonderful things that you can do here to give and to get involved in these ministries, and I hope you do. That's why I spent the time going over those this morning, all right? Now, the third kind of giving that I want to talk to you about, and then we'll end, is the, to give a sacrificial gift, to give a sacrificial gift. Now, what I mean by this is that sometimes God asks of us in our heart, we know this, he asks us to go way out on the limb, more than we ever thought we could do, right? And you think, oh, I can't do that. But then God asks you, come on out here. And we see such a, a gift like this with the sacrificial gift in Luke 21, 1 through 4. It says this, as he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two uh, very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said, Jesus said, 
This poor woman has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty, but in all, she put in all she had to live on. Now, guys, when I look at most of our giving, it is out of our surplus. It's out of what we have. You know, when I tithe or when I give a free will offering that I do and stuff like that, it, I have plenty to live on, right? I always have plenty to live on. It's like surplus giving. But there's another thing when we're asked by the Lord, or he puts it in his heart for us to give everything we have, right? And that's what this widow did. She put in her last two pennies, <laughs> right? She now had to trust God that he was going to provide for her. That's called a sacrificial gift. And let me, let me just say this about a sacrificial gift. You know, when we are able to answer that call that God puts in our, house, in our hearts to do a sacrificial gift, it, it's one of the biggest things that you could do to grow your faith. Because what happens is you get right in the stream of God's miracles, all right? It's almost like you get to see the inbreaking of the kingdom of God here on earth right? And you see the coolest things. How do I know? Well, a couple of weeks ago, I told you about a sacrificial gift that Andy and I gave uh, to help promote uh, being able to tell people about Jesus Christ in this community, right? We didn't know quite where our, last, our next meal would come, so we gave all that we had. That was a sacrificial gift. And I tell you, I have been part of God and watching people find Christ, watching them be revolutionized, watching them find and fulfill their calling in life. I've watched the Lord move in such hard hearts that I thought it could never happen. He broke through and he did something marvelous in their lives. But it all stems and goes back to being able to, to uh, give back sacrificially when God calls on you to do that. And I believe, I'm a firm believer that God will ask each and every one of you that somewhere in your journey that you will do that, that you will give a sacrificial gift when he calls upon you. And you know it's sacrificial because it's way beyond what you have, what you can do, right? And so I want to encourage you to go there because you grow like nothing else. You get to be on the cutting edge of, of watching God's kingdom just break into your community, into your families, and into your friends' lives. Now, let me leave you with this last scripture here. It says, uh, Luke 6, 38, Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured onto your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be used to you. And so what this, when I read this, I always chuckle to myself because you can't outgive God. He like plays a game with us. Like I say, okay, God, I'm going to give you this little bit here. And God says, oh, no, I'm going to give you that back in a different way. And then you go, okay, I'm going to try to outgive you, God, <laughs> right? So here's a little bit more, God, you know, and it'll grow. And God's like, no, no, I'm going to bless you that much more. And so you play this game with the Father, and you follow him. And believe me, when we manage God's money, he wants us to be able to give it away. And so we need to set up our lives so that we're in a position to respond and say, yes, Lord, not only will I give you to you and your work, Lord, I'll give free will offerings like to that building fund or, or to one of those ministries. I'm going to be involved, right? That's what the Holy Spirit is saying today. Well, bow your heads with me, and I'm going to close this in prayer. Yes, Lord. Lord, there is none like you in all the earth, Father. None like you. Father, you call us in the great uh, commandment. You say, will you learn to love me with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and with all the life that I have poured into, your into you? You say, will you follow me in those, and will you love your neighbor as yourself? Father, those things can only happen as your Holy Spirit works in us, because I know, God, when I do a self-exam, I am too daggone selfish and too self-centered. And so I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come and that you would enlarge us, Lord God, that you would enlarge each and every one of us to be children of the God Most High, to be like our Father. And Lord, you said to me this morning that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are spiritual for the pulling down of strongholds 
And so, Father, I ask that you would release your people and we pull down the strongholds that would suppress your people, Lord, and cause them not to rise up and not to be the head. Father God, I ask that, uh, uh, yep, that you would move in a mighty way, Lord, so that this group of people, Father, could stand on the wall here in Virginia, Lord, in Virginia Beach, and that they could not only be a light to their community, Father, through their sacrifice and their love and their giving, but, Father God, that they might shine out so that all would know of your great love and your great mercy and how you bring people home. I hear that. I hear that call. And so Father says there are some of you in here today and you don't have this relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm stopping here to talk to you. And everyone who does have it, you need to be praying. You need to be praying for those folks that come in here and you've been wrestling while I've been talking. Well, I want to lead you in a prayer. It's just a simple prayer. It has nothing to do with me at all. It has everything to do with helping you to connect to the Father, to accept that new life that he's offering you, that forgiveness. And so right where you're at now, you just say, Father God, I want this. I don't understand everything, but I'm reaching out. And Jesus, I ask you to forgive me for my sins. And I ask you to be the leader of my life the best way I know how. I'm reaching out for you. All right, now I'm going to pray for you that we're praying that prayer. Father, I thank you that you seal it in their heart. You say, those that believe in their heart and confess with their mouth, so shall they be saved. You've actually written their book. Yeah, I see that. You wrote their name in your book. And so, Father, I ask that you would deposit your Holy Spirit in them, that they would go forth with strength and with might. And I thank you, Lord. Just come more, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.